Today is July 14, 2006. We are at 8333 Douglas Avenue, Dallas, Texas today to take the oral history of Harold Berman for the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. Um, my name is Rosalind Benjet and our videographer is Jan Naxon and we're going to start. Mr. Berman, tell us about your parents. Where did they come from and how did they get to Texas? Well, my father was uh, Hyman Israel Berman. Everyone called him H.I. or High. Uh, he, originally, he was born in Russia, came over through the port of Galveston in uh, 1904. He was about five years old at the time. And he came with his mother and two brothers. Uh, his father, my grandfather, was already here in Seguin. Texas, and they came over to, through the port of Galveston. Uh, that's a story in itself, but it's a, it's a beautiful, I want to tell you, it's a beautiful story. Uh, my grandmother, who I was four foot ten, uh, came over on this trip from Burma, Germany, with these three boys, the oldest five years old, and the youngest about, uh, I guess, a year, year and a half. And uh, she had absolutely no money. We, we've traced all this back and have determined this. Uh, when they arrived, all three of the sons were sick, either with scarlet fever or whooping cough. We haven't determined which yet, but they were quarantined. They were taken to the Catholic hospital in Galveston where they spent three weeks. According to the record, she had zero uh, wealth. All she had was tickets for her family from Galveston to Seguin that had been sent to her by her husband. After three weeks, they came to Seguin, and uh, when she arrived at Seguin, uh, uh, she was rejoined with her husband, who she hadn't seen in about three years. And my father and his two brothers grew up in Seguin, Texas. Uh, they eventually had a, another child, a sister, a girl, a little girl. Uh, her name was Lena, Lena Berman, and uh, they, at the time they came to Sagi, my grandfather was peddling, but eventually built up and he had a little grocery store which he was supporting his family. And as the boys grew up, uh, they began to realize that that one little grocery store wasn't going to be able to support all four of the children and his parents. So my uncle Max, who was the oldest, uh, had an opportunity to go to Colorado City, he was Colorado then, uh, to begin working for the West Texas Dry Goods Company, which was owned by Lewis Landau. And in those days, they had these Jewish patriarchs in the various small cities throughout Texas. In Colorado City, Lewis Landau was the patriarch of that area. His son, by the way, is Sylvan Lando, who's here in Dallas now, my close personal friend. But uh, my Uncle Max started working there, and then as my my dad got a little older, he was the middle son, he says, come on out here, this is the land of prosperity out in Colorado City. So he went out and he looked over the land and, and decided he would open up a business that wouldn't compete with anyone else. So he opened up a five and ten cent store. He was the first store in that area that laid the merchandise out on the counter where you could feel it. Everyone used to have it in glass cases. But he had a five and ten cent store. It was called Berman's Variety. Eventually became the Ben Franklin store. He was the charter member of the Ben Franklin chain. And then later became Berman's Variety again as he dropped out of that chain. But he was in business there in uh, Colorado City. Um, my mother, he was a bachelor. My mother uh, was born in London, and her mother died in childbirth uh, with her. And uh, her father left London and came to New York trying to make his way. He was a tailor. And uh, he was in New York and remarried uh, in New York. And uh, he left my uh, mother, I think she was about four or five. And then when she was about 12, the 
she was living with a, an aunt and uncle and cousins. Uh, they decided they were going to migrate to Australia. So they got a hold of her, their father and said, you take her now or we're taking her to Australia. <laughs> so he took her. She came to New York and she grew up in Brooklyn. She got to Colorado City because her stepmother had a sister who was married to someone in Colorado City, the Bodsons. Uh, the Bodson, Frank Bodson, run for mayor here in Dallas, but he was one of the Bodsons of Colorado City. So uh, she was looking for a husband, and so they invited her out to New York to visit her step aunt. And she was there, and they introduced her to uh, uh, several uh, men there. She always says her first date was, was Reuben Williams. I don't know if you Reuben Williams was a former uh, railroad commissioner in Texas. He was a lawyer in Big Spring. That was her first date, which hit West Texas. So he wanted to show her some of West Texas. He took her to a Ku Klux Klan meeting <laughs> in Big Spring, and she talked about that the rest of her life. But she did, eventually met my father, and it was love at first sight. And they were married in 1924. I was born in 26. I was the first of three sons they had. And uh, they lived in Colorado City. Uh, their, their entire life, my uh, my dad's younger brother eventually came to Colliery City from uh, Seguin because after my grandfather died, uh, he had this small store, uh, a grocery store, and things were changing in those days. So he uh, came to Colliery City and joined his brothers and opened up a grocery store. So we lived wholesale in Colliery City. I had one uncle that sold all the clothing to us. One uncle sold us all the food and what they didn't have, my dad had in the variety store. But uh, it was a great upbringing. Uh, they were one, at the time I was growing up, they were one of uh, three of uh, ten Jewish families in Colorado City at the time. The Landos were still there and there were a few others. And almost um, uh, Louis Landos, the secret of all these patriarchs, would bring these young Jewish boys out to work in the store. They always made the best clerks. And then to keep them, they'd go out and find them wives. So my Uncle Max is married to a distant cousin of Louis Landau. My uh, Uncle Philip is married to a, a cousin, uh, not the Landau, but one of the, his, his clerks. So they all met their wives out in Colorado City, and they all grew up uh, together. My, my cousins, my Uncle Max had one daughter, Phyllis, who lived here in Dallas, she just passed away last year, Phyllis Rudnick. And then my Uncle Philip had uh, two sons, uh, Joe and Melvin. Uh, Joe lived in Dallas, and now he lives in Arizona, and Melvin's in California. My two brothers, my younger brothers, who were twins, uh, were uh, living in California now, one in Lake Tahoe, one in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. So I'm the only member of the Berman clan from Colorado City, still in Texas, although all of the others would love to come back. <laughs> uh, we have a great love of Colorado City. My father was the mayor of Colorado City for a lengthy period of time. He was elected mayor on the uh, on the sprinkler system ballot, uh, there were there were ten people in the in the city. There were five thousand population, ten of which uh, ten residences had sprinkler systems, and the city council levied a special tax on sprinkler systems, and that just raised an uproar. So, you know, all the people who owned sprinkler systems got my dad to run for mayor, and he won with. Uh, on the platform to repeal the tax on sprinkler systems <laughs> and to fire the chief of police. And as soon as he got elected on the first day, he, uh, the first meeting they repealed the tax and he fired the chief of police, which uh, uh, who was a hoodlum I mean, he eventually ended up in prison. But I remember the day he fired the chief of police, he and my mother came to Dallas to uh, stay with us for safety. <laughs> 
but hey. um, it was a great, great upbringing. You mentioned the, the name Landau. Was that a connection to the well-known director, Martin Landau? I don't think I don't so. Think I don't so. think there's any. I thought there was a Dallas, mm -hmm. Texas connection somehow. No, I, uh, Sylvan, of course, was uh, very well known here. He became the, uh, uh, under Hager, he was with Hager Pants. Right. Uh -huh. He is Hager Pants, or was. He's now uh, retired. But uh, then Willie, uh, his brother, eventually came to Dallas. And he's, his widow still lives here. So what was it like being a child in, in Colorado City in the, during the Depression, too? Right? I was born during the Depression, and uh, uh, my, my brothers, uh, uh, at the time they were born, it, my parents did not expect twins. And when they had twins, my dad said the next day was the best day he had in store to that point because everyone came by to give them the condolences. <laughs> have, to, have to feed an extra mouth at that. <clears throat> but we had a wonderful upbringing, had a marvelous education, small town education. Um, some of my teachers were outstanding. In fact, uh, my English speech drama teacher was selected by the University of Texas system as the outstanding teacher, high school teacher of the 20th century. Her name was Glass Miller. She was marvelous, just an unbelievable teacher. And we, <clears throat> the whole Berman family went through the high school. We, we ran a string there. I was valedictorian in my class. Mm -hmm. uh, my brothers, uh, one was valedictorian, one was salutatorian of his class. Joe was valedictorian of his class, and Melvin was valedictorian of his class. Melvin had the highest average. I had a 98.2, and Melvin beat me. <laughs> but Melvin was probably the brightest of, of the brightest. He's now our multimillionaire, but uh, he was he was a cousin, like his youngest cousin. Now, did did you have enough Jews in um, Colorado City to have a synagogue? We um, no, we did not have a synagogue. The nearest synagogue. Uh, and that was built later in my life, was in Abilene, which was 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. But we did celebrate the high holidays, and, uh, and usually with the Levy's in Sweetwater, uh, which is only about 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. And we always uh, uh, used the ballroom of the Blue Bonnet Hotel. I know the Blue Bonnet Hotel from top to bottom. Uh, as a kid, we used to run up and down where they had the services. The, the services were usually performed by uh, a member of the community, and it was strictly, you know, they were immigrants and they uh, orthodox service, and our knowledge of Hebrew, my knowledge of Hebrew, was almost nil. So it was a boring thing for us when I was growing up. But later on, when the war started in 41, uh, our services were usually conducted by a, either the chaplain from uh, Barclay Air Force Base or from uh, uh, some Jewish soldier from. And this Air was Force in Sweetwater. Base. This is Sweetwater. Mm -hmm. Now our Seder, our Passover, we always had in Colorado City. That was uh, the big thing, and usually brought in uh, everybody from Colorado City, Roscoe, Lorraine, uh, Snyder. I had an uncle in Snyder too. Lena married uh, uh, someone from uh, San Antonio, and she migrated out to West Texas and ended up in Snyder. They had a grocery store there in Snyder. But it was um, uh, all usually held, at, at first it was held in one of the Berman homes. We used to run it around, but it got too big. So we had the Colorado Hotel, had a, had a uh, large ballroom and, and they, they used to furnish the entree which is for, for the Seder was always barbecue chicken that's the reason I love Seder's and Colorado City <laughs> but uh, my mother used to and my uncle used to make um, the uh, matzo balls my mother's matzo balls were famous because they were heavy you know she had learned from her stepmother they were baked and hard as a rock in fact one of them, they did 
dropping a plate and just split the plate open. <laughs> we talked about that. The other was very fluffy, so everyone always had one of each. And like a filter fish was made by my uncle, who turned out to be a Navy cook. They drafted him, and he was pretty, well, he was in his late 30s, and he became a Navy cook. When he came back, he was excellent. And he did all our sailors and catered out there. But growing up there was a wonderful experience. I, uh, even my brothers and I uh, reminisce. We have reunions. We had a reunion out there about seven or eight years ago, which I recorded. You'll have to see our intake on it. But we brought people from California, Dallas. We had buses that go out. Our mayor of the town turned out for us. We were on television. We were on the radio. The museum had a special exhibit for the Berman family and uh, had a brunch for us, served out of solid gold plates oh, that someone goodness. had donated to the museum. They used them for us. But uh, right now there are no Jewish families left there. Uh, I uh, was invited back and I did go back uh, at an old timers reuni reunion and made a speech about the Jews in Colorado City. And uh, in my research of that, I was—I uh, found out startling things I didn't know before my time. Mm -hmm. uh, there was even a Jewish bootlegger out there at one time that I wasn't aware of. But uh, uh, the Berman families uh, uh, were very well respected there. My uncle Philip uh, ended up owning the largest grocery store there, which he sold out to the largest grocery store there now, and he gave the building to the city. So they have all the city offices are in the building he, he gifted to the city. But uh, when we go there, only the only people who remember the Burmans are the older, older people. Right. My dad, uh, about half the population uh, in Colorado City at one time started their careers working in my dad's store because he always had the entry level people find a ten cent store. And I still get letters from people who who say that uh, your father and mother did were everything to me. I became a CPA because he let me do book work and you know those kind of things. And um, my mother after she moved to Dallas, she was a widow here and uh, she had constant visits from people in Colorado City because uh, she in particular was uh, extremely well liked. She was a uh, leader in the Eastern Star, which was a Masonic uh, order. My dad was the regional governor of Kiwanis, uh, but uh, she uh, used to, she was with my dad every day in the store. And she'd go to market. She was loved dolls. She'd buy dolls, but when she bought dolls, she didn't buy them. She bought them with someone in mind. And when she got back, she'd call the parents and says, I got your Christmas present. Uh -huh. We're putting the layaway as soon as it gets here. She was you. a true merchant. Oh, yeah. And she was so just very well respected. And of all the Berman wives, uh, one of the three, uh, she was sort of the leader. She had that husband from New York, you know, that Brooklyn husband. And uh, she, she used it well out there. Now, did you have any kind of discrimination when you lived in West None Texas? None at all. And that was one of the keys of my speech. My brothers and I had, had no recollection of any anti-Semitism whatsoever during our whole time. And uh, neither did my uh, cousins. Now, I'm sure there was some. I know that my Uncle Max could never get into the Masonic Lodge while my dad and, and uncle did, but I, uh, and someone said that was because someone didn't like him, got crisscrossed with him. But uh, I felt not, and my, in fact, uh, we observed all the Jewish holidays out there, all, this, all the stores, all the Burma stores were closed during the high holidays. The uh, uh, Abe Levy's wife, Frida Levy, who uh, used to run a little Sunday school at her house and for all, all the kids in the vicinity. So my parents used to take 
my brothers and I to Sweetwater every Sunday when she was operating and we'd have a little Sunday school so we we knew we were Jewish uh, we knew we were uh, looked on as Jewish uh, but uh, the only time that we uh, ever had any discussion about it is when uh, there was a these revivalists used to come to town and uh, there was one that uh, made Colorado City every year he, he advertised himself as the converted Jew mm -hmm. when he came. He was a heck of a speaker, but uh, he was no more converted than I was <laughs> because he always wanted to, he always wanted my uncle to order him, you know, kosher delicatessen and he always wanted an invitation for dinner and of course mm -hmm. kind of <laughs> shut him out. <laughs> But other than that, uh, it was a marvelous upbringing. Well, what were your interests uh, as a teenager? Well, my mother decided when I was young that I was going to be the lawyer, and my brothers were going to be the doctor, so we had no choice after that. And so we were put on a course for that at the very beginning. I was interested in, in uh, you know, my school. I was, I was an officer in my class. I don't remember what officer I was. Uh, I did a little drama work in high school. I played tennis. I played, uh, I, uh, played uh, well, football for one time. I didn't do that too much. Anyway, the, uh, uh, we were very concentrated on getting our education. Uh, I think that was my dad and mother thought we had to, had to uh, excel, maybe because maybe we were Jewish and people looked on us as such. And, uh, Anything other than an A in my family was not acceptable, and I mean that. <laughs> I used to get rewarded when I yeah. got A's. I used to get an ice cream soda. I was a little overweight. Just let me just turn it off. Because I don't know which one. It's not that. The other. Okay. I think I've lost it. still going. Okay. So after high school, where did you go to college? Went to the University of Texas. Uh, this was in 1942. You know, the war had begun in Pearl Harbor in 41. I was 15 years of age at that time. I graduated at 15. You graduated from high school at 15? High school at 15. So I That's pretty impressive. Graduated in May and I was at the University in June. So I was 15 when I went down. The university was operating on a 12-month schedule then because of the war. And I went to the university, and uh, that's really when I uh, probably got my first Jewish experience. I joined A.E. Pi, which was a Jewish fraternity, and I have a history of A.E. Pi. I'll tell you about that a little later. But uh, I continued the University of Texas until I was drafted. I was drafted when I was 18, uh, which I turned 18 in June, and I was in the Army in September. And I, was, I was in law school at that time. I'd already been, I was in my first semester in law school. That's how rapidly we you went got educated. school rapidly in those yeah, days. Well, at that time, you didn't need an undergraduate degree to go to law school. We had combination degrees, uh -huh. and I was taking a plan to combination uh, business and law. I had finished a kind of hours to go to law school, so I was in law school when I was 17, and then turned 18 in law school. And then went into the Army? Went into the Army. Was in the Army for a couple of years, got drafted, uh, went to Camp Hood for infantry basic, and then out of America, I got pulled out with one other. There was two Jews in the whole company, and both of us got pulled out. He was sent to Texas A&M to study engineering under the Army, Army Student Training Program, and I was sent to the University of Chicago to study Japanese. So I uh, spent nine months at the University of Chicago uh, in 
concentrated study of reading and writing Japanese. And did you learn? Uh, at that time I got along, but uh, uh, my army service became a censor. And when they sent me to Japan, I was assigned. This was in the uh, occupation period? You know, I went over uh, in the arms of in August. I hit Japan the end of September, 1st of October. It was still a scary time. But I was assigned to MacArthur's headquarters with the censor, and I was the only Caucasian enlisted man in the unit. Everybody else was Nisei, second generation Japanese, third generation Japanese, and their language skills were far superior to mine. So they kind of looked on me as an outcast. Although I did make a lot of friends in Japan uh, with the Japanese community, and eventually I did do a lot of work with the Japanese community here in Dallas uh, in my earlier years. But uh, that was quite an experience. Oh, did you ever return to Japan? No, mm -hmm. and I regretted that too. I regretted I didn't go in the ice cream business to stay there. <laughs> 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 but after that, after I got out of there, I went back to the University of Texas. I got my undergraduate degree. Uh, I got back in midterm and I, uh, law school was a little difficult to get in in midterm. So uh, my mother insisted that I make a, uh, an application to go to Harvard Law School. And I did. I got uh, accepted uh, based upon the grades I would make that next that one semester at the university. I had to get my degree. And I did. I got my degree. And I did go to Harvard Law in 1947. Mm -hmm. And. What was that experience like after the war? Were there a lot of returning um, service people? Yeah, I was in the first peacetime class at Harvard Law. And I, I have to laugh here because my mother used to brag, you know, he's Jewish, he's going to be the only Jewish student at Harvard Law. Harvard Law at that time was one third Jewish. <laughs> and at this time, probably is more than that. But most of my classmates, at least all my roommates and everyone else, were all Jewish. But um, I spent three years there. Uh, uh, Harvard at that time was all male. There were no women. We were the last class that was all male in 1950 when I graduated. And uh, I was, when I got out, I, you know, we had a, uh, too many lawyers in the world. I wanted to come back to Texas. I was going to get married. I wanted to come back. This town was loaded with lawyers, and being a Harvard lawyer made it a little tougher because they, they were afraid you didn't know the Texas law anymore. Even though I had a Texas background and did spend a summer in Texas law school you know, trying to get some of these Texas courses, uh, it was a little tough. And uh, I eventually started practicing law in Texas in '50. I started about myself, and then. And where, did, where did, you, did you go back to Colorado City? or? No, no, I came to Dallas. You came to Dallas. Yeah, I got married uh, in July, right after I, got, I graduated, and mm -hmm. settled here in Dallas and started the practice of law. Mm -hmm. I've been here ever since. And you, went, you started on your own? Started on my own and then uh, got a job with the uh, firm of Cornbliff, Thus and Jaffe. That's Emo Cornbliff and Morris Jaffe. And I was with them until they broke up. And then I practiced along with uh, Sharon Office with Eva Carbleth for about 17 years. And then we formed our own firm. There was a little firm. And uh, our firm dissolved. It was known as Berman and Fickner, and then Berman, Fickner, and Mitchell. We had about 40 lawyers when we finally dissolved, which was the smartest thing we ever did. And uh, I've been practicing alone for the last 10 years. Right. And what kind of cases do you specialize in? Well, I'm certified in estate planning and probate, so I do a lot of probate work and estate planning. I more than, have to have more than 50 percent to keep my, my specialty, but in my career I've done it all. I mean everything from, from drawing wills to uh, capital cases. I, I was appointed on a capital case way back. 
appeal. And I didn't take care of that. I'll tell you something later. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the interview. Um, what, what would you say was the most memorable case that you handled? The uh, most memorable case was probably from Uncle Max. Uh, it was tried out in Sweetwater. It involved the lease. But uh, it turned out that uh, he was a defendant and, and one of the, uh, he was being sued because uh, they claimed he violated a restrictive covenant by renting the building that my father's store was in to uh, another five and ten cent store. So there was a uh, lease. That was memorable for several reasons. First, my Uncle Max, and he passed away during the litigation. So uh, I think we had a substitute for him. And uh, we had everything happen in the Sweetwater. They were remodeling their courthouse, so we tried the case in the Safeway store building. And the uh, acoustics were pretty bad there when the jury was deliberating. We could hear everything they said. And also, one of the other parties had a heart attack during the case, uh, during the trial. But uh, the jury came in against us. We won it on appeal. They went to the Supreme Court. We won the Supreme Court. But uh, the Supreme Court upheld it, or they reversed? No, no, they upheld. They upheld. It. We won the case eventually. Mm -hmm. But that was uh, my my most exciting case of my career. I've had others. Right. Now, what was it like to be a Jewish lawyer in Dallas in the 50s? Well, there was a, a you know a group of Jewish lawyers here. They didn't have a Jewish bar, you know, like we, we have a group here now. And uh, that was done purposely. They didn't, they didn't want to be segregated as such. Uh, however, uh, uh, they were mentors to all young Jewish lawyers. Emil Karmbluth was one of the pillars of the community. He had served on the city council in his career, and uh, he was really uh, an outstanding lawyer and gentleman. And uh, he cautioned me, he told me, you know, what to, I should be careful of, who I should be careful of, who I can trust, who I couldn't trust, mm -hmm. who I should put everything in writing. Now, were Jews um, in, represented in some of the larger firms at that time? Uh, was I represented? No, no. Were, were there Jews? Who yes. Oh, yeah. One of the leading firms in town was uh, Thompson Knight Wright and Weisberg, and that was Alex Weisberg, who was one of the uh, leading. Well, it was the largest firm, and Alex was the managing partner of that firm. Um, in fact, I'm going to a memorial service for Marvin Wise. Uh, this afternoon, Marvin Wise had joined that firm right out of Harvard Law School, and so there were there were large firms here. I will tell you, Rosalind, that Dallas um, Jewish lawyers in Dallas were acceptable. Right. Houston, they were not. I interviewed in Houston, trying to get a position there when I was looking back in '50, and I was told by a Jewish lawyer, a very prominent Jewish lawyer. I was wasting my time that the no one's going to hire a Jewish lawyer in Houston. Not even him. <laughs> he had a firm and he wasn't hiring Jewish lawyers. He said that it's not good for the business. But to hear it, uh, they were very acceptable. Large firms brought them in and uh, it was hard to get a position. And, and, uh, the top pay was at $250 a month. And that's what I got. I thought I was. Riding on the cloud. <laughs> um, you became interested in serving the Jewish community as well during I that did. Time. I, I think I owe my fraternity for that. Uh, I got very involved with my uh, fraternity, Alpha Epsilon Pi, uh, so involved that I'm still I've had it uh, 60 some odd years later. Uh, but it is. Now it is the, the predominantly Jewish fraternity, maybe the only one left that's predominantly Jewish. But uh, we got, uh, we were very much involved in the Jewish community. 
academically throughout the country. I became national president in 67, 68 in that area and traveled the country with the Football Fraternity and all the Jewish uh, organization. But by reason of that, we brought uh, national conventions to Dallas. David Kaplan, who was my mentor in AEPI, uh, he was a past national president as well. And we brought them here, and as a result of that, uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, Jewish young men who were AEPIs in, in Dallas, either most of them from the University of Texas, our chapter there, or from other chapters. And we had a very strong alumni club, and from that I got interested in Benet Breath. I met Jan's uh, father there, Bill Maxson. He Benet mentioned Breath, that. Right? Yeah. And uh, we, the George Levy Lodge was a new lodge, and they were looking for people, and I was a young lawyer, so in, I think 1951 or so I joined that. And uh, uh, that led me to the uh, Jewish Community Center. Jewish Community Center in the 50s here was not like the Jewish Community Center of today. Ooh. It was the black sheep of the community. Why was that? Uh, we had a very unusual uh, federation at that time. I don't think they've completely left that thought behind yet, but they didn't feel that we needed that. You know, we, we had a YMCA here that had good facilities. There wasn't still that feeling, I guess, that the, the Jewish lawyers had that they didn't want to be identified as such. But uh, Julia Sheps uh, uh, had put together this uh, uh, building program uh, out on uh, North Haven and they built the Julia Sheps Community Center. And uh, uh, I, you know, I was a member, but I never really was active in a lot of their programs. But pretty soon I started going to their meetings etc. And then I became president of the, of the Jewish Community Center at that time. And Which year would that have been? It was in the 70... It, I, I looked in the files at 72? Somewhere in there. I, I was also president of the Columbia Country Club at the same time. Ah. And if you want to have a, a married experience, uh, that was it. I, mm -hmm. I, I was both ways, but the, the Jewish Community Center uh, really piqued my interest. I, I, I've never, you know, I, my Jewish education has been limited over the years, and, uh, but I had a strong Jewish feeling by reason of AEPI. And given an opportunity, I'm still convinced that the community center was the, the core, the basis for the strength of the whole community. Oh, yeah. We could just get everyone with an affinity towards that center, then you could uh, eventually depend on them to be Jewish when you need it. If I may say something, yeah. I, I remember when the JCC opened about the mid-50s and it was a small building with a little area on the side we could have our little day camps at. Yeah. And it was great because before that we were at Bachman Lake. But um, it seems like it pretty much stayed the same for 10, 15 years. Was it around the time that you were president that they started expanding? It was. Because Actually, it seems like that would be into, you know, my teen, late teen years. It was uh, a stepchild in the community until uh, uh, the 60s, in the late 60s. Uh, the director there, Ernie Siegel was his name, a leftist went to Israel to step up for him. And uh, we were without a director, and uh, I was on the selection committee, and, and we found Harry Rosen. Harry Rosen was a true center professional. He had had a lot of experience in Jewish community centers throughout the country. Oh. And he came, and uh, that's when I began to realize, you know, I'm, I'm just a volunteer. We have a professional here. And, We'll discuss the matter with him. If he says we can do it, we do it. Well, he turned the thing around. He really, he put us on the financial mm -hmm. level. We started raising money to expand, mm -hmm. to put in a health club. There wasn't a health club at that time. Right. Um, 
I was involved in the, I was the president at the time we were doing all of our, our uh, money raising. I uh, owe a lot to Mary Mumpus and Henry Cohn who were oh, gosh. extremely involved yeah. in, in that fundraising program. Uh, we raised the money and built the center. Uh, I was uh, happy to be, I don't think I was president at the time, but I got the, the uh, honor of introducing our celebrity at the opening. We had Gabe Kaplan down here oh. <laughs> to open the Welcome new, Potter. new center, and he, we were all in the gym, and I got to introduce him, and he gave us a program, and uh, he was uh, one of the, I forgot who brought him down. Someone paid his fee and brought him down, but we had a great time. That was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Still interested. Go and you were president of the Columbian Club at the same time. Same what time. was that like? Different, but uh, uh, at that time we were Jewish as we could be, <laughs> and um, it was a different experience. You know, a country club is a lot different than a community center. Sure. Uh, it's a private organization. Uh, we didn't look to any uh, charitable funds to uh, operate, and uh, I got very interested in the uh, field of privacy and, and Jewish clubs. Uh, I was instrumental uh, in representing the Columbia Country Club on a group that uh, put together legislation and passed the Greenbelt Law in the state of Texas, which has saved clubs. What is it? It's called, it's an open space law that allows them uh, to treat their property that they keep as golf courses and open spaces for its actual value rather than its highest and best use. Because the Columbian Country Club was on land that was zoned for commercial and uh, they were being taxed out of, out of uh, existence, okay. even though they were using it for a golf course mm -hmm. and others. Uh, this law came into effect in the 70s mm -hmm. and uh, it saved the club industry. Uh, we were the third state to have it, now there's about 40 states that have Greenbelt laws, and uh, as a result of that, uh, I got more and more interested and started serving you know, the state association of clubs, and the national club association, and I'm now uh, past president of the national club association. I was the uh, first Jewish president they had, and uh, they have a very strong Jewish club, private club uh, nucleus of members. They used me as a, I think, for that purpose. But I, I didn't mind being used because it was a wonderful experience and it was a great opportunity. Yeah. Were you involved with any other um, organizations? Uh, well, I, I, B'nai Breath, of mm -hmm. course, I mentioned. Um, I've been involved in a lot of nonprofit associations. Uh, over the years, uh, I was past uh, president of the Alpha Epsilon Pi Foundation, which is a 501c3 uh, foundation uh, for them. We, we do a lot of scholarship work. And what I'm most proud of is my wife's organization, which is Attitudes and Attire. It's a 501c3 unit. It's now 10 years old. Uh, it was her aspiration, and I was able to help her. And, now they have a million dollar budget and they're just doing fantastic work. They're helping women from all over the place. And, uh, so I'm very proud of that uh, opportunity. And she's still actively involved and I, I have the title of legal counsel. <laughs> <laughs> but they do good work. They do all the work. And tell us about your family today. Well, I'm married to Lynn Berman, Lynn, who uh, we've been married, uh, we're on our 29th year. Uh, she's my third wife. I was widowed twice. Uh, my uh, first wife was uh, Annette Corchin, who was here in Dallas, uh, who I married right out of law school, and I have a daughter by her. Uh, my daughter is Tony, Tony uh, Berman, who's now Tony Silverman. 
she's been married a, a year longer than I have, been married 30 years. Her, she lived here in Dallas for a while. Her husband was a pediatrician, and uh, he got the uh, mid-age jitters and went to San Antonio where he runs a pediatric uh, emergency uh, dealing with the major hospitals there. Uh, I see quite a bit of her. They have no children. That was my choice. And they live in San Antonio. They live in San Antonio. Uh, then her mother died when she was 13, and uh, I remarried several years later to Sherry Cotler from New Orleans, who had three children by a previous marriage. And uh, uh, she passed away nine years later. She had a cancer and passed away. And uh, I still see uh, at least one of those. I'm in contact with all of them, but I don't see them as much because they were all adults when she passed away, all except uh, the youngest, Bruce, Bruce Katz, who's here in town. And uh, Bruce lived with Lynn and I for the first year. He was graduating the University of Texas. I had the opportunity to educate all those children. Then I married Lynn several years after uh, Shirley's death, and she has two children. able to bring them up and educate them. I have four grandchildren by them, and uh, they are the apple of my eye. <laughs> and are they living in Dallas? Uh, two live in Dallas and two live in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, our, my son, uh, Steve, has twins. They're two and a half, and they're in Arkansas. We just visited them like two weeks ago, Q as they could be. And, uh, Allison, our daughter, has uh, has a son and, uh, and, a, and a girl, a little girl, who's two and a half years old. The son's seven years old. So they're young, and we get to see quite a bit of uh, Allison and her family. Spend mm -hmm. a lot of time with them. Good. Is there anything that you would like to add? Well, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I've been very fortunate in my life. Uh, I come from wonderful parents who had uh, great ethics and uh, loved their children. And uh, although uh, I used, when I was younger, I used to think my mother was a little overbearing, uh, I now realize that, that uh, she was. 100% correct. Uh, she kept us focused to our future. Uh, both my li my life has been wonderful, except for the you know, high tragedy of having uh, two wives pass away. But uh, I'm married to the most wonderful woman in the world. I have the most wonderful family in the world. I have two great brothers who have families. We're able to talk a lot, and uh, we have reunions. We're planning one now. We can't decide where to go, but we're trying to plan another reunion. And uh, so it's it's really been a very good life. Uh, I've been a member of Temple Emanuel since 1950. Uh, I, when I married into my Dallas family, uh, they were members of Temple Emanuel. My first wedding was in the old temple out in South Dallas and South Boulevard. And uh, I've been with this one ever since there. I've gone through a lot of rabbis. Of course, Rabbi Klein is, uh, is special to me. He married sure. Lynn and I 30 years ago. And we celebrate our anniversaries with him uh, still. But uh, it's been, uh, I, I think we have a, a great uh, opportunity here. I, I'm a strong believer in our Jewish community, probably more than most people. Uh, I just feel that um, there's a lot of pride here. Uh, we have a marvelous Jewish history, as you know, <laughs> in this town. I'd love to go to the, the community center and look on the wall 
go to Columbia Club. Well, I hope you long. go to our programs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I do, so occasionally. But you have, you have my grandfather on your wall in your Texas room. His picture in Seguin. And I had never seen that picture until it was on the wall at the center. I think my Uncle Philip had it in the basement of his home because my grandmother lived in that for a while. But it's, a, it's been a great experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Jan. You all that, Jan? I think that's fine. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity. It's finally been right. found to be that. But they laughed us out. I mean, he's sitting there with me, and I'm talking about how incompetent was, and I had a list of things that he didn't do. And they just laughed us out of the court. You were way before your time yeah, there. Yeah, we were. But anyway, both boys, I, mean, I met them both, and I, I was ready for them to kill them both. They were just, mm -hmm. they were horrible people. Even their parents hated them. And mm -hmm. they both, they got the, they both electrocuted. Was that any kind of landmark case or anything that decided anything? Uh, they, I read about in the paper occasionally when they talk about Johnny Size, they talk about the Johnson brothers, so, but they both were dead and it was good riddance, really was. They had absolutely no defense, they just shot him down and killed him. Mm -mm -mm. He was 20 some odd years old. Every time I think about it, it makes me sick. Yeah. Well, is that a reason you got away from the criminal law, you think? Well, I didn't do much after that. Yeah. You know, when you're in general practice and you're trying to make a living, living you don't and do you got so many criminal work. you take whatever you can yeah. get. Yeah. I did some, you know, a lot of DWIs and, and uh, did a lot of bail, get people out of jail a lot. Right. I used to always be available for night calls. But that's changed. So uh, we're continuing on talking about uh, golf, golf now. <laughs> well, I, I'm a fanatic golfer. I've been playing, starting out in Colorado City, and, uh, and played as much as I could uh, through the service and through law school. But uh, when I was president of the Columbia Country Club, uh, I got a call one Saturday afternoon. We used to work on Shabbos in the law profession in those days. and. Uh, there was a gentleman on the, on the phone calling from Montreal, and he says, do me a favor, do not hang up on me, listen to me through. And I said, why? He says, well, because I just talked to someone in Houston hung up on me. He, he's, his first question was, are you president of the club in the country club? At that time, they had a Jewish club in Houston called Westwood, which they don't have anymore. And I said, yes. And he says, well, he says, we have a a society uh, of Jewish golfers made up of presidents of or captains of Jewish country clubs or golf clubs throughout the world. It's called the International Golfing Society. We've only been in business a couple of years, but we're trying to get a, a Jewish member from Texas because they're trying to get really international. So we want to know if you'd be interested. I said, well, send me some stuff. And he said, well, I'll do that. He says, but our next meeting is in, in October in Palm Springs. And uh, I said, would you like to come? I said, well, Palm Springs is a beautiful spot. I says, well, you know, I figured it was a money giving. And he says, well, the whole package is 600 bucks. That's for a week. That's your hotel, food, <laughs> golf. That's for a couple. And I says, uh, I said, you're going to have to send me something on this in writing. So he did, and that was the package, and I went. And it turns out that uh, this International Gothic Society was created by, uh, out of a club in Montreal, his club. They celebrated their 50th anniversary, and they thought it would be a great job, a great idea, to invite uh, members of Jewish clubs from everywhere in the world. Well, what they didn't know is that the Jewish golf captains in the UK were organized. So when they got the invitation, they came over in mass. <laughs> I mean, 
they were over in, in Montreal in, in Mass. And it, it, uh, they decided it was a great thing and they were going to create this society and they were going to build it. I was a member for 23 years. Every year we met someplace in the world, uh, usually every other year in the United States, and then after that, somewhere else in the world, all Jewish, uh, had services on Friday night, uh, kosher meals if you want. We had the first golf trip ever to the to Israel, played to Caesarea, stayed there nine, wow. nine days, played nine rounds. Uh, in fact, they made a gift to Caesarea of uh, golf carts. They made 23 golf carts, uh, $3,600 a piece. I mean, this was... Uh, About what year was this? This was in 1980-some-odd. Oh, okay. This group was made up of Jewish uh, golfers from all over the globe, uh, principally from uh, USA, uh, UK, and Canada. But we had members from South Africa, members from Venezuela. We had members from uh, uh, Israel, uh, France. Australia, uh, so it took us all over the world. In fact, the, the last full meeting I went to was in Australia. But uh, it was, we had a formal way of, of doing it. They, they had the same thing every year. They had a golf competition among ourselves, and we had a formal dinner at the end. In fact, uh, just two weeks ago, Jan Mary died, you know, right. something the paper? Right. When I went to Palm Springs, Jan Murray was a member of the group, and he was uh, the speaker. He was, had the entertainment at the banquet in Palm Springs. That was my first one. But as a result of that, uh, Lynn and I have made friends from all over the world. We have a, he passed away, but uh, we had a, uh, our, our closest friends were in London. One of them was knighted, one of them was a lord. He was a member of the House of Lords. But uh, we played golf with them all over the world, and we're still very close to their, their widows. Uh, the, uh, the experience was unbelievable. You talk about Jewishness, I really got some, uh, some real Jewish experiences. And, the, and I was an oddity to them, you know. Uh, West Texas, uh, Jewish boy, they had never, they, they couldn't believe growing up in a small town with 10 Jewish families. <laughs> but it was quite an experience. But it was, the, the IGS still exists, uh, but most of my friends have passed away. Mm -hmm. But I did have a call this year from the lawyer in Atlanta who is now the, kind of in the executive committee. He asked me to come back, and I told him I was too old for that. So they're looking for another Texas golfer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. th but, you know, whatever, three, three minutes. No, I think we're fine. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you. I'm sorry I get to talk and I No, know. that's fine. That's what we're, it's about. <laughs> we're right th I think we're right on right, right now. Okay. We'll just stop the tape. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a picture from the Dallas Morning News where they had a feature on gray-headed women. <laughs> and Lynn was one of their features. She wears her hair gray, very short, and uh, I think she's a beautiful, beautiful woman. She sure is. She's, she's as sweet inside as she is on the inside. Great. Let's go look at some more over here. She's got a heart of gold. All right, let's go look over here. These are all of the different, I, I keep, I've been taking some home because I cluttered it up. And, uh, oh, let's start over here with Tony, I remember. Uh, this is Tony. From growing up in the Tony 50s. Tony and Maury, this is her husband, Maury Silverman. Uh -huh. They're now in San Antonio. Tony is some glare. She's, she went to school in Dallas, graduated Hillcrest High School. And she got her master's at SMU. She and her husband are both math majors, but he went to medical school. He was from Arkansas. He went to medical school at the University of Arkansas. 
And then who else do we have? Well, then we have uh, Lynn and her daughter, Allison, who is the mother of the, the redheads. Okay. And this is Allison's son. He's our oldest grandchild with his dog, Flash, and Flash's friend. I don't know who that is. <laughs> oh, and here's another good one of Lynn. Okay. So this is Lynn and, and of I. Of course, the two of you, yeah. some special occasion. Oh, uh, this was taken uh, in, uh, mm -hmm. in Cannes, France, at the International Golfing Society function. Oh. And uh, we were together in France. Okay. We have about 60 seconds. Any other pictures? We'll just kind of, here's a grandkid, here's a grandkid. Grandkids, yeah, here's. Oh, and whose are those? That's, uh, that's Jacob and his sister, Madeline. Okay. Jacob is seven, and Madeline just about and, two and a half. And they're uh, they're here in Plano. Okay. About to move to Murphy. They sold their house last weekend. Okay. And was this them when they were younger? These two? Yeah, these are the same pictures, okay. same kids. And are these? These are the twins. Oh. Live in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, or Roger, Arkansas. Uh -huh. Their father is. Uh, he works for Diablo, which sells. Uh, uh, Guinness beer and spirits and okay, we're and out. We're, we're out of tape. But okay, well, we got them. We got the two. Got set the grandkids. Okay, great. I did show you. My well, guardian, <laughs> my guardian angels. In fact, the, okay. there's a drawing that someone. It looks like zero though. My puppy. Yeah, zero. They weren't my puppy. They were my